Right, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Very good point, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Um, first things first, in the event of a fire or emergency, the fire exit is that door there, go down the stairs and head to the other side of the car park and away to rescue. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the work I've been doing over the past uh, two and a half months, going through the geology collections here at Craven Museum and Art Gallery. And then we're going to take a little bit of a, a look at some of the collections themselves. Um, under normal circumstances, I'd say pipe up the questions as and when, but as I'm re recording this, uh, if you could wait till the end, I'd greatly appreciate it. So, let's begin. Uh, so, as I said, the first thing I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about what the collections are, what we've got, how I've been going through them and cataloguing them, what's been done, and then I'm going to take you through some of the collections. Uh, so first of all, what does the museum have? Well, the museum has quite a sizable geological collection, including general geology, paleontological specimens, and mineralogical specimens. Uh, consisting of approximately 21 collections, uh, individual collections, and a large number of miscellaneous donations, so that's individual specimens that have been donated by various people over the past uh, 100 years or so. Uh, there's well in excess of 2,500 specimens in total. Uh, I've unfortunately only got to about 1,500 of them, but hopefully later on some, someone else can come along and finish the rest. Uh, it covers a vast tract of time. We have specimens in this collection going all the way back to the Ordovician period, so that's 505 million years of Earth's history. Uh, it also covers a great geographical area, as we have specimens from as far afield as the United States and the Pacific Islands. Um, however, the vast majority of the collection is from the Craven area and the Lake District, as well as various other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, we have two important collections, one which is nationally important, and that is the uh, Raystrick Mineral Collection. Uh, that has been used in the past by the British Geological Survey as a sort of uh, a type collection, sort of uh, the perfect collection to come and see if you want to know anything about the geology and the mineralogy of the local area. Uh, in fact, it has been referenced in several guides, so I'm told. And the second collection is an internationally important collection, and that's the Tidium collection. Now, uh, that is uh, a large number of specimens from a reef and oil deposit, so similar to Old Bolton Hill or Swindon Quarry. Mm -hmm. And as far as I've been able to find out, it is the only properly excavated reef and oil uh, collection in the world, hence its importance. How do you go about uh, going through a geological, geological collection? Well, the first thing you do uh, is you come along, you have a look at the collections, and you see what state they're in. And for me, that was a bit of a panic, um, because, as you can see from this photograph, they weren't exactly in the best state. However, once you've finished panicking and uh, put yourself together, you get onto the real business and you start organising the collection. And with the help of many of the people in this room, the volunteers, over a period of, must have been about four or five weeks, uh, we went through all of the boxes in the, in the three cupboards and sorted them out. So we now have most of the collections sorted into which collector collected them in various other ways and means. Uh, the next thing you do is you try to order, order everything. So you find if you've got any documentation that tells you what's supposed to be in which collections, and you try and match up the numbers in their catalogues with the specimens on, in the boxes. Uh, and you'll notice this is the Holgate collection, and you'll notice some empty boxes flying around. Um, unfortunately, some of those are still empty. Some of those specimens haven't been found. Um, but I'm hopeful that somewhere in a box in the store is a, a lovely, well-catalogued, well-looked-after box which has all the missing specimens in it. And finally, you rebox everything, you put everything into boxes, and you move on to stage two of the process. The stage two is to go through the collections and identify everything you've got. So this, this specimen here is a trigonia. It's a bivalve mollusk from uh, the Jurassic period, I believe. Um, and so you go through various forms of literature, you go through the internet, and you try and identify everything as best you can. Now, being an early stage scientist, I'm early career, I haven't done everything perfectly, I will have made mistakes. And there are a vast number of specimens that I've just looked at going on. I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. Uh, even with the literature I have at my disposal. Uh, once you've identified everything, we have to go on to documenting it. Um, this, this is sort of a three-stage process in itself, because first of all, there are a lot of things that have changed. 
For example, a lot of the specimens in the collections here uh, of Sphalerite were labelled as blackjack. That's, if you like, a folk term that's no longer technically correct. So you have to go through and um, uh, make changes as and where they're needed. And unfortunately uh, for museum curators and the like, scientists have this annoying habit of changing things every now and again. They decide, oh, that shouldn't be in that group of animals, it should be in this group. So they change names and everything. Everything has to be done again. So you go through everything, you try and correct all the mistakes and the errors, and then you produce these little labels to go with the specimen so that whoever comes along in the future can go, oh, oh that's what that is, and uh, know immediately what they're looking at. And finally, the most time-consuming and possibly most boring process in the world is to go through and put them onto the computer database. No matter how many times you do it, how many templates you create, it still turns out to be a long-winded, rather boring task. But there we go. So that's how you catalogue a collection. So where are we now? How far have I got? Well, all of the specimens that were on site in this building have now been, at the very least, sorted with the help of the people in this room. Um, of those specimens, or of the um, collections you can see here, only three of them haven't been touched in any great way at all, and that's the Waters Tinman and miscellaneous donations. Uh, the reason being, the Waters and Tinman collection, for the most part, are in an off-site storage area. They're not here, so I haven't had access to them. And the miscellaneous don donations, there are so many of them, and because they're miscellaneous, I thought it best to go through the others first. Um, there are several collections which have been sorted and boxed, but they haven't been catalogued, and that's the ones in uh, orange here. Um, that's probably, for the most part, going to be someone else's job, as I'm going to be disappearing on Friday. Um, however, all of the stuff in green here has been done. It's been uh, sorted, catalogued, and for the most part, a lot of those have been accessioned for the first time. And what that means is that they've been brought in and put on databases and into a register so that we actually know what we've got now. Um, so that accounts for about 1,500 specimens, and it's all been reboxed into 140 boxes, which are in the cupboards where they came from, and hopefully now anyone who wants to come and see them can come in and immediately be able to find something they want. So what can be done in the future? Well, there are several things. Um, first of all, there are still things undone. There are still catalogues to be done, to be produced, and specimens to be identified. Um, now, some of you volunteers might have some geological knowledge and might want to come and have a go at this, or the museum might be lucky and get some more funding for someone to come and finish the job. The second thing is a photographic record. Unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties with the copy stand, uh, most of the specimens I've catalogued haven't been photographed. Uh, this is something that you guys can definitely do. It's really easy. You take, take a box of specimens and you photograph everything, put it on the database. It might take you a few years to finish it, but it certainly is like you can come and have a go at it. Producing a collection narrative. This is sort of a bit optional, really. You get someone who has the prerequisites of knowledge to come in and go through every box and do a long, long-form explanation of everything that's in them. Um, as I say, it's optional. It, most museums don't have one, um, and I'm not even sure if it's considered best practice or not. And finally, the last thing, the sort of end goal of any curator or collection manager's dream is to put some of this on display. At the moment, it's sat forlornly in boxes and people don't know it's there. Hopefully, one day, not too far from now, someone will have the courage to put these things on display and there'll maybe be some money to make it look nice as well. So, I'm going to now take you through some of the collections and have a little bit of a discussion about uh, where things are from, what, the, what they tell us about the past and what the environment was like when they were found. I will be going mainly through paleontology here because Unfortunately, the minerals aren't datable. You look at them and it's a mineral, it's not got any way to tell how old it is or so. But first, I need to talk to you a little bit about geologic time. Um, I apologise if I'm going over old ground for you. Um, please bear with me. Uh, at the bottom of this diagram, you can see the entire history of the Earth, all 4.6 uh, billion years of it. Um, I've highlighted, essentially, in that period, three main events. At the very beginning there, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth was created, um, or formed, I should say, um, from a, an accretionary disk of dust and gas forming around the, the young sun. Uh, approximately 0.9 billion years after that, 900 million years to be alright, 
Uh, we get the first origin of life that's provable. We have the first bacteria and stromatolytic forms that we can say defini definitively these are real. They're not some kind of mineralogical, mineralogical uh, artifact. And then we have a long period where nothing exciting happens. Um, the only things on the Earth are single-celled organisms who do nothing more than create oxygen and generally prove a nuisance to all the other single-celled organisms. And then 630 million years ago, we have the first multicellular life forms. Still don't know exactly why this happened, when it happened, but it did. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anything in the collections of that age. So we're going to skip forward again to uh, this period here, the Ordovician. Um, I should say the entirety of this is not to scale. Some of these periods are 10 times or 100 times longer than the others. Uh, that top one, for example, is only 10,000 years long, whereas uh, you can see the bottom there, that one's about 65 million years long. Um, so we will be aware it's not to scale as we're going through. Um, so the first things we have in the collection are from the Ordovician period, and for the most part they are not paleontological specimens. We have, for example, a wonderful specimen of uh, the Borodell volcanic series, uh, which, if any of you have seen any programs about the Yellowstone National Park volcano or uh, Santorini or uh, the, name. the volcano in Indonesia that went up in 1886. Thank you, Krakatoa. If you've seen anything about those, you'll know something about um, the type of volcanism we had here in the United Kingdom 505 million years ago. Um, we're talking about uh, ocean uh, the island ocean volcanics. So much like many of the Pacific volcanoes today, but in the Lake District of the United Kingdom, we have at least four provable caldera volcanoes, the most famous of which being the Scarfell caldera. Uh, you may not have heard of it. Right? When I say the most famous, it's the most famous within scientific literature. Um, but that is the volcano that produced the Borodell volcanics, um, which includes this specimen here, which I will pass around because it's fairly sturdy. Um, and that is a, a piece of what looks for all the world like a piece of slate, and it is formed entirely of volcanic ash, which is why it isn't a slate. A slate would be made of uh, mud. Um, but over the intervening 500 million years, it's been crushed and uh, heated to such an extent that it now has the texture of slate, uh, which is interesting in and of itself. Uh, we also have graptolites in, in the Ordovician, uh, which we do have one or two specimens of on the table over here. I didn't vote for them because they're not that much to look at. Do we move on now to the Silurian period? Um, a little bit closer to our own time, and we have the first things that you might be able to recognise. Uh, these animals are trilobites. That's the, the head of a trilobite there, and that's the entirety of one. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, only the hard parts are preserved. We don't have, in most cases, any soft part preservation. So I have a wonderful picture of a model that I hiked off the internet which gives you some idea of what the animal may have looked like in life. Uh, I'll pass around a little specimen for you to have a look at. I apologise if the light's not particularly brilliant, but you might get some idea of what we're looking at here. And these could be anything from a few millimetres in size up to about this. Um, so we're looking at the bottom of a tropical sea sort of environment at this time. Um, and I'm afraid that's all I have to say for that period, so we're going to move on. <laughs> Um, we're going to move on now to the Carboniferous period, and this is um, probably the most relevant part of this entire collection to Craven because most of the rocks around here are of the Carboniferous age. Um, you may have heard of the coal measures, uh, which is why I've got this wonderful picture of the coal measures forest. Um, we have wonderful specimens of various forms of plant from this time, including uh, the famous Lepidodendron tree. That's a piece of its bark. Uh, some leaves here from another, uh, possibly a lepidodendron or another tree, I don't remember. And also here, this is a, a stem of a plant called Chordates. Um, if any of you know the Morgan horsetail, it's the same thing. Uh, the only difference being, uh, Chordates were about 30 to 40 feet high, whereas your average modern horsetail barely manages a single foot. Um, we also have as already mentioned, the reef knoll deposits from the Tidman collection and also a rather nice series of brachiopods from a reef knoll deposit collected by Dr. Arthur Raystrick, who you may know. 
Uh, moving on again, we're going to skip past the Permian because nothing much happens uh, in this part of the world, and also we're going to skip mostly past the Triassic period. Um, the rocks of the United Kingdom don't contain many rocks of these ages, so there's not a great deal to talk about. We do have a couple of bits of red sandstone of this age, uh, which is why we have this picture up. The environment at the time was one of a, a dry, arid desert, and it stayed that way, mainly as a result of all the continents starting to group together in what would become known as Pangaea, or All Earth. And you can see uh, surrounding Pangaea, the Panthalassic Ocean, which, again, all oceans. Um, so this is the sort of environment we've been looking at, and these are the deposits that we're looking at here. This is um, a series of red sandstones, the red colour indicating the, the, the arid environment, and also fluvial deposits, which are these sort of funny lens shapes on each side there, and they are riverine rivers and flu fluvial deposits of various forms. In fact, the only common fossils we find in the United Kingdom from this age are of freshwater bivalves. Uh, so freshwater scallop shells, if you will. Skipping on again to the Jurassic period, this is uh, not as well re represented as the Carboniferous, but we do have some specimens. Now, this, of course, is the age of the dinosaurs. We do have a couple of bits of dinosaur specimen in this collection. Uh, this chap up here is, we don't have, but this is the most famous dinosaur from the Jurassic period in the UK. It's called Cuscolidosaurus harrisoni, and uh, I come from the place where they discovered that in Lyme Regis. Um, but what we do have are a vast variety of ammonite specimens. Um, I'm sure you're aware of what ammonites would have looked like, um, which might give you some humour to notice this chap has a carved head. Um, I don't know how many of you know what that symbolises, uh, so I'll just briefly explain it. It's all to do with St Hilda and the Abbey at Whitby. Uh, there is a legend of St Hilda uh, turning all of the local snakes around Whitby into stone. And uh, to honour this, if you will, um, the local monks and local tourist shops nowadays carve little heads onto ammonites and sell them as Hild St Hilda's snake stones. However, they, what they really would have looked like is something more like that. So more like an octopus stuck in, uh, stuck in a shell, or if you're aware of it, the modern day Nautilus. Unfortunately, they, en they ended... Uh, their reign at the end of the Cretaceous along with the dinosaurs and various other animal groups. And nowadays there are only six species of creature anything like this, and that is the um, modern Nautilus. Uh, we also have a rather wonderful specimen just behind me over here. Uh, you'll have a good look at it later, I'm sure, of the skull of an ichthyosaur. Um, now this is interesting because it was found in, th in three separate parts in the collection in three separate places. Uh, so it just goes to show what a state the collections were in when we started this endeavour. Um, moving on now to the Cretaceous period, we don't have a great deal from this, this period of time. We do have a large number of uh, echinoderms or sea urchins, a variety of fossils of that type. And we also have some wonderful vertebrate specimens in the form of shark's teeth. Now this is, these are the teeth of a shark called uh, Hypodus. No it isn't, I'll tell you why. What is it called? Tycho's, P-T-Y. Um, and it would have quite happily swum around on the seafloor, much like a nurse shark does today, um, eating shells and bivalves and small creatures, which is why, unlike your uh, megalodon or um, great white shark teeth, these are just crushing plates. They're not sharp. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily be harmed in any great way if it decided to have a nibble. Um, Moving on again, we're going to skip forward to the Eocene period now. Uh, so this is about 40 million years ago, so we're getting a bit closer to the modern world, and you can see how close we are by the uh, diagram on the top right there. And that shows what the world would have looked like at about this time. Um, we have a large number of Eocene fossils. We have um, a few beautiful specimens of amber from the Yorkshire coast. Now these don't come from Yorkshire, they don't even come from the United Kingdom, but they float in the sea, and they come across from the Baltic Sea, uh, from areas of the world like Estonia. And you'll, you might just be able to make out, in the middle of this piece of amber, which is one of these over here, we have this wonderful little spider specimen. Now I've got a hand lens with me, so after the talk you can come and have a really good look and see all of these gory bits and details. We also have a large number of fossils from further afield than Yorkshire, and, but a lot closer than uh, the Baltic Sea. This is a variety of fossils 
fossil shells and gastropods in the main from Bartmore Sea in Hampshire. And these, these are interesting because they are used, much like ammonites are for the Mesozoic period, they're used as a zoning fossil. So these tell you how old a particular layer of rock is if you find that specimen of a species in that rock. So they're used as zoning fossils. In fact, the entirety of the British Cenozoic Fossils book, which is one of the books I've been using for identification, consists of these in the vast majority. We're going to skip ahead again now, uh, quite a long way, all the way up to the Pleistocene. So this is the period of time that ended about 11,000 years ago. Um, you may be aware this is commonly known as the Ice Age. Uh, and the, if you look at the map in the top right there, you'll see just how much of the world was covered in ice at this time. Um, looking more locally, it covered the vast majority of the United Kingdom, and at various points it advanced south and retreated back north across the UK. Which is why we have in our collection a couple of wonderful specimens of limestone. Now this is local stone, but as you can see, you might just be able to make out all of these wonderful scratch marks which were made as the glaciers flowed over the top of these rocks. In the bottom of the glaciers they hold large boulders and small rocks and bits of what is called a rock flower, literally flower sized pieces of rock. Um, and they scrape away at the surface and over time this is what creates the wonderful sort of Lake District, Cairngorms, the, all those wonderful U-shaped valleys and hanging valleys and, and also some local features which are going to in a minute. But we don't need to look into the collections. Uh, this is a, a photographic image from uh, Landsat, it's a satellite of the American zone, and this is an image from the BGS memoir about this area. Uh, if we zoom in to just about where we are, you'll be able to see all of these little hummocks. These are called drumlins, they're small hills of uh, glacial till, that's material deposited by the glaciers as they retreated back up to the north. And uh, you may or may not know that Skipton is built for the in the vast majority on top of these drumlins. So if you've ever walked up Castle Street, that's why it's so steep. Moving on again, we're coming more into Amy's domain now. This is uh, the period of time which encompasses all of human uh, civilization, all of human history. And there's not very much geologically that I can talk to you about, so I've just picked out two small things. This rock here is called Tufa. And it's calcareous rock that is deposited by um, water around springs near carbonaceous rocks, so rocks with calcium carbonate in them. Uh, it essentially consists entirely of calcite and it's very porous. Um, and we've got a specimen over here which you can have a look at in a bit. Um, and also, secondly, we have wonderful specimens in the collection of stalagmites and stalactites and other, other forms of cave formation. Um, on the left here, you can see a stalagmite. Might, stalactite, sorry, uh, made of calcium carbonate, so calcite, the most, far, by far the most common mineral you'll find these made from. But on the, on the right here, far, far more interesting from my perspective, is a, is a slightly rarer mineral called barite. And this is usually deposited in hydrothermal environments by hot water coming up from deep within the earth. But this has been deposited in a cave and you can just about make out various different layers within that, and they are the layers of de deposition through time. And these might be annual deposition, or even in some places as quickly as daily deposition. That is pretty much all I have to talk to you about in person, so just really quickly, I need to say thank you to Renaissance Yorkshire for the money, and to the volunteers, a great big thank you for helping me. If you have any questions, once I turn the cameras off, feel free to ask them. Thank you very much.